Welcome to the sixth Big Bang Finals. Uh, Big Bang, as you know, is UC Davis's business plan competition. It's organized and run by the graduate student management, the students from the MBA program. My name is Pramod Parihar. I'm the chairperson of this year's organizing committee, and I'll be talking us through the program tonight. Big Bang has a mandate of promoting entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial culture in UC Davis and its community. Now what that means is anybody who is affiliated with UC Davis can enter this competition. Affiliation could be a present student, an alum, a full-time or a part-time student, a faculty member or a staff member. We require that one person in the team is affiliated with UC Davis. So it's not a ringer. We try to combine MBA types on the left, the business types, with the researchers on the right, and that's the start of the whole process. Yes, a lot of MBAs, as I said myself, might come into the MBA program with an idea, but many of us I know say, I, I, I need to work in this industry. I, nanotechnology is wonderful. I want to work in that, but I don't have an idea. So what we try to do is get the researchers and UC Davis gets a lot of money in terms of federal grants, state grants, grants from private companies for research. So the idea is to combine these two groups and sort of form the, make a team happen. And the way we do it is we collaborate with Little Bang, and I know McGowan is going to talk about that, and we have mixers where we get the scientists and the business students together in a room. It could be as simple as hey, my name is so-and-so, I have an idea. Are there MBA students who are interested in this idea? So we try, and we have other ways where you can go up to our website and send us your idea and we'll try to match you up with an MBA student. So once we have teams going, what do we do? We put them through what we call as the Big Bang process. Now, we are very fortunate that we have strong support from entrepreneurs, leaders, within the UC Davis community, as well as Bay Area VCs and Sacramento VCs. They come and help us with workshops. They come and help us with mentoring. They guide these teams through the process. Once the teams are formed, and hopefully they are educated by now, they go and enter the Big Bang competition. And there are several rounds to this. The first round is just an executive summary. It, fo it follows with the semifinal rounds where you have to turn in your full business plan. And we end with today, which is the finals. And so the students or the winning team actually walks away with money. That's fantastic. They walk away with something more valuable or equally valuable maybe. The experience of having gone through this entire process. So this is our timeline. And as you can see, it coincides with our academic calendar. We start very early in fall, and our first event is what we call as our kickoff event. This is when we introduce Big Bang to UC Davis every year. And last year, uh, on October 26th, we were fortunate to have a wonderful speaker, uh, Gunnar Wickert. He is the founder and CEO of Invantage Venture Capital. He spoke to us and gave us insights on what's happening related to the VCs and startups in the pharma industry. And just as a data point, about 30% to 40% of plants that we see coming into Big Bang are related to biosciences and life sciences. We followed that up with a workshop on business plan and business modeling. And this was fantastic. I mean, it was a standing room only workshop. So how would you pitch? How, what, what's your elevator pitch? Now, many of us, when, before we come into the business plan, uh, into the MBA program or start this, we have no idea what an elevator pitch is. So how do you sell your company just during the time it takes for an elevator to go from between a floor and floor? So the two-month pitch. How do you put together an executive summary? What goes into an executive summary? 
all was absolutely wonderful. And for us MBAs and for the researchers, it was fantastic. It was a wonderful experience. We followed that up with a finance and marketing workshop. What is your revenue model? How should you put together your financial structure? What are the things that you need for your business plan? What are the things that you can show to uh, VC? What are, th what are the questions that they'll be asking you? Uh, the marketing part of it. What, what is your competitive strategy? Who are your competitors? What sort of analysis should they be looking? Again, all, all these presentations, all these workshops were tailored with what are the tools that you need to go out there and make your company happen? So if you're looking for partners, if you're looking for investment, what are the things that you need to do? Now, on Jan 18, January 18th, we had a wonderful and a very exciting event. What we do is we find two really brave companies. Um, we bring them here in front of a panel of VCs, and we ask them to pitch their business plan so that it's a real, uh, re real pitch. And the VC panel then gets to grill them with questions. And the benefit for our students is they get to see, or our team says, they get to see what an actual VC pitch is like. And all this is happening, if you remember, before they actually go into the red dates, which is basically the uh, fe February 15th and February 12th. We follow it up with an IP and a legal structure workshop. All research has, most research has an IP and it needs to be protected. The teams have some idea about it, but they need to be educated about it. What's a copyright? What's a patent? How do you do it? What things can you patent? What can't you patent? Uh, what should a company structure be? Do you want them to do an LLC? Do you want to do a, C, a corporation? Do you want to do a partnership? Strange terms for many scientists and many MBAs, but so this is a good place to get them thinking about that. So, by Feb 8th, hopefully everybody is nicely educated. On February 15th, we have executive summaries that we collect. Each plan and each executive summary is sent out to seven to eight judges, if not more. We get feedback, we evaluate them, we pass them on to the semifinal rounds, and we also send the feedback that we get from the judges back to the teams. And again, it's a part of the learning experience. So that brings us to today. The next, next speaker uh, is the force behind Little Bang. She has done two things in the two years I've been here, actually, which I want to bring out. One, I've seen Little Bang grow in the last two years. I've seen the quality of the end results that come out of it really improve. And the second thing I've seen her do is build a closer partnership between Big Bang and Little Bang. So it's Big Bang and Little Bang combined together working towards an entrepreneur community. So, Meg, please. Hi, I'm Meg Arnold. I have done those two things. I hope I've also done a couple more or else the people that I work for would be a little bit unhappy on the return on their investment. Um, but I, I do want to thank Promode for the opportunity to talk tonight. Little Bang is, um, is a, a, a collaborative effort between UC Davis Connect and uh, the Graduate School of Management and particularly the Big Bang Committee, which is a student-run exercise every year. And um, I'll echo Promode's comments and say that we're very pleased to have had an increasingly close and collaborative relationship between successive Big Bang teams and the Little Bang, um, which is um, run out of the, by UC Davis Connect, out of the Office of Research, so it's a staff and administrative function under the leadership of uh, Vice Chancellor Barry Klein, who's here with us this evening. Um, Little Bang was, um, I'm glad it's grown in the last two years because three years ago it didn't exist. Um, so it, it's intended and it's designed as a precursor and an entry point uh, to the Big Bang. And its main goal is at the top of the slide, it's, it's intended, as the Big Bang is, to encourage entrepreneurship in engineering and the sciences, and in, um, in less delicate terms, to spread the entrepreneurship bug out of the Graduate School of Management and across the campuses into the scientific and the engineering disciplines. 
Um, a little bit about the structure of it. It is, um, uh, it's, it's based around five different sectors which are organized along technology lines. This year um, we had competitions, distinct competitions, one in clean energy and the environment, the second in nanotechnology, the third in computational science, um, the fourth in medical and biotech innovations, and the fifth in um, one, of the, one of the campus's new areas in, of initiative, which is uh, foods for health and wellness. And um, we had uh, 19 teams competing across all of these five sectors. Um, all the winners and the runners up in the Little Bang automatically qualify as Big Bang semifinalists. So that's where, how you see the, both the interaction and the, the purpose of the Little Bang serving as a, as a funneling mechanism into the Big Bang. Um, it is a poster-based competition which is very familiar medium, communications medium to graduate level stu uh, students in the sciences. You, you make posters that are actually quite a bit bigger than that one. They're four by four foot. And in the, in the, in the sciences, you create a, a, a poster to um, summarize and communicate your um, research results and your conclusions from your research. The Little Bang takes that poster concept and asks the competing teams to split the poster essentially in half so that half still discusses the research results that are coming out of the labs on campus, but half takes a new angle and a very different angle for many of the competing teams to um, look at that technology from a commercial and a marketability perspective and talk about market potential, competition, how would you go to market, what are your funding needs, and really at the very basic early level start that type of thinking. The goal is that they'll, the teams will get sufficiently excited and interested during this process and motivated by the potential for competing in the Big Bang that they will in fact all go on to compete in the Big Bang, whether through the regular channel or as an automatic semi-finalist qualifier by winning. There's a little added incentive in that if you win, you get $3,000, which never hurts. Um, it has proven to be a very productive entry point for the Big Bang, both last year and this year. This year, the Little Bang provided half of the um, total pool of Big Bang semi-finalists, and it provided four of the six finalists that we're all going to enjoy seeing this evening. So we were very proud of that. Um, not just in terms of that productivity, but uh, in terms of what it signals about um, our efforts to spread entrepreneurship across the campus um, into areas where it is not historically all that present. This is <clears throat> too small for you to read, um, but it lists <clears throat> all of the Little Bank competitors in all of the sectors this year. Um, as I said, there were 19. Um, this was uh, an, a, p a piece of material that was put together for the Little Bang Awards announcement, which took place at the Sarda Tech Index lunch in early February of this year, um, and is another example of the collaborative efforts um, that the Little Bang is really focused on because we worked very closely with our generous um, sponsor and regional support for entrepreneurship, which is Sarda, the Sacramento Area Regional Technology Alliance, and Oleg Kaganovich, the executive director and CEO of Sarda, is with us this evening, which is wonderful. Oh, and I'm highlighting, um, so that you can't read them, the um, winners and um, the runners-up in all of these five sectors who were, went forward as automatic semifinalists into the Big Bang this evening. And um, I would be remiss, uh, highly remiss, if I didn't conclude by um, thanking another cr critical set of our collaborative uh, partners, which are our financial sponsors. Like the Big Bang, the Little Bang is self-supporting. Um, the sponsors contribute directly into the competition by providing the cash awards that, that go directly back out again. Um, to the winning teams in their cash awards. And this year we were really pleased to have the support of SMUD, the McClellan Technology Incubator, PG&E, Weintraub Genschler Chediak, Cornish and Carey, and Downey Brand. Not on here, but I also want to mention um, again, of course, Sarda for their partnership with the event, and SACTO, the Sacramento Area Commerce and Trade Organization, um, that, which played an instrumental role in bringing many of these sponsors um, into the relationship with the Little Bang. So with that, I'll, I'll say thank you and good night. All right, the prizes. On your chairs, you have a ballot. Uh, it's for a People's Choice Award. And the way this works is you, the audience, gets to decide who you want to give this $2,000 to. And we're going to do the sort of the wisdom of crowd thing. 
Now, you can pick based on any criteria you want. Most likely to succeed, maybe, as a business. Are there VCs in this room? Am I going to fund it? They are friends and family. I have to give it to them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, pick a criteria, any criteria you want. And we're just going to go on wisdom of the crowd. Hopefully, the team that you win or, or that you pick will also be the winner that the judges picked later on, uh, earlier on in the evening and after. We are very proud to announce that we have increased the prize money this year by more than 50%. Our prize, our second prize and first prize are 5,000 and 15,000 now. Uh, one other quick point about the People's Choice ballots. We will have presentations now of the 16, or, or six uh, finalists. We'll take a break. At the break, there will be committee members at both the gates, so just drop your ballots to them. So six finalists, fantastic teams, innovative design automation, smart moms, Nova chemicals, mislights, ensembles, and SOYAM. Each team speaks for 10 minutes. They will be given an alert at 8, and it's a hard stop at 10. So with that, innovative designs. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Brian Hoblett. I'm the Vice President of Technologies at IDA Technologies. Pardon me. Vice President of Finance at IDA Technologies. My partners, Ben Mock and Jorge Campos, would like to thank you for the invitation to speak here this evening. IDA Technologies presents create software solutions that reduce the cost and time to market of circuit design by up to 30 percent. Our flagship product, mutation-based validation paradigm, provides automated, real-time background validation throughout the design process. In essence, we're taking a serial design process where there's human interaction required at each step of the process and converting it into a parallel design process, eliminating many of the inefficiencies in the overall process. Current landscape is if you're about to go out and design a circuit, the first thing you need to know is it's going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to cost you between five and ten million dollars. A typical chip might have 100 million transistors and is going to take 100 man years to design. It's an extremely complex process that's often, often prone to errors. The current market for designing these circuits, you're going to use a software product designed by one of three firms, Cadence, Synopsys, or Mentor Graphics. Those three firms make up the, the vast majority of a $2 billion a year industry. In the history of computer circuit design, there's been two major breakthroughs. The first occurred in the mid-1980s when the Department of Defense created something called the Hardware Description Language, which described uh, computer circuits in terms of a software code. Then in the early 90s, syn uh, Synthesis, excuse me, converted the high-level impl implementation, it converted the code down to a low-level implementation, and this low-level implementation was used to actually fabricate the chip. MVP, our flagship product, is the third technological breakthrough in this sector. It's going to create the automated, continuous background validation of the high-level implementation. Our market research estimates that of the overall design process, about 60% of the effort is involved in the validation. MVP, because it can eliminate some of the inefficiencies in the process, can cut out about an overall 30% of the design process. For the hypothetical chip I talked about earlier that takes 100 man years to design and build, or to design, pardon me, that results in a saving of 30 man years, or about $2.6 million in salary savings alone. That's a conservative estimate. We probably could have bumped that up if we used, uh, if we used some of the money that we were going to pay our, our, our employees. So how does MVP work? Basically, what MVP does is it takes the software, looks at mutants, and a mutants is, is any portion of the software code or any portion of the chip that has to deal with a logic, a piece of logic. Where there's multiple pieces of logic tied together, you end up with, with basically a complex portion of the chip. MVP identifies those portions of the chip and tells the design engineer that this is the part that needs to be validated first. MVP will do the validation. If there's any errors in the chip, it sends it off to the design engineer while it's still processing in the background. The design engineer can make the, the change if there's an error and send it back to MVP, which is still working in the background. 
On the right, you can see a schematic of what our overall software product is going to look like. It might be difficult to see. What we'd like you to notice is that the overall image, the overall process is simple. It's going to be an easy plug and play system that's going to work in conjunction with the existing software products from the big three firms. The landscape out there right now is, or the, the, uh, the competitive ad advantage that we're trying to provide is that chip design using our process in conjunction with the three software products, you're going to end up with a faster, uh, cheaper and more robust chip design than without using our process alone. If they don't use our process, our main competitors are basically the status quo. It's not going out and spending a little bit of money to save a lot of, uh, to save a lot of money in the process. Our sales and marketing initially is going to be focused on small to mid-sized firms with thin margins. There's a couple reasons we want to do this. We think that these firms are going to be initially able to take advantage of the cost savings that we're going to be able to give them, and that's going to give them a competitive advantage in their landscape. Additionally, they're going to have quick turnaround times, which, which is going to allow us to take our results and publish those to uh, other companies in the sector. Early on, we're going to build a conference and trade show presence, helping to get some of our initial results out uh, via white papers and via presentations at these conferences. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we're going to invest heavily in experienced sales staff. This is an extremely small, close-knit community, the EDA community, the community that designs these chips. It's a small, close-knit community. We can go out and get a salesperson who knows all the decision makers at all the big firms. By doing that and by investing a lot of money in these folks, we can get our foot in the door at a lot of different places. One of our initial goals for early adoption is going to be using beta testing. We already have an agreement with a firm out in Roseville, Sierra Logic, to do beta testing later this year, fall 2006. We believe this is critical for the early adoption of our, of, our, of our software product. The reason is because there's a lot of inertia in designing circuits, and people don't want to change what they're doing. Through beta testing, if we can show that they're going to save 30% of their overall costs, we're going to end up with a cost savings, and we're going to end up with a client. Additionally, we can take these results and we can, we can send it off on the white papers and at the trade shows and, and get some more customers that way. Profit and loss statement, there's a lot of numbers up here. Let me just focus on a few of them real quickly. First is our pricing. We, we're going to price our product at $20,000 uh, for the initial purchase of the seat and a $10,000 a year reoccurring fee. Um, we're not anticipating selling one license in the first year. In fact, we're not anticipating selling anything for the first six quarters. However, because we're in a high margin industry, because we're doing software with high fixed costs and, and low variable costs, there is the potential to make, make a substantial profit down the road. Our team, our founder, president, and CEO is Jorge Campos. He's a, pre a PhD student in electrical and computer engineering here at UC Davis. Ben Mock and myself are MBA students at the graduate school, and between us we have a few years of experience in design and applications, and also in small business development. Our board of advisors, we're very fortunate to have three dedicated board of advisors. First is Jim Schraith, who is the former CEO of ShareWave. It's a fabulous semiconductor uh, design firm, be the ideal customer for using our product. He's also the former senior vice president at Compaq Computer and has 25 years experience in the computer and semiconductor industries. He's very well connected. He's already opened a lot of doors for us, and he's, help and he's helping uh, to open some more in the future. We really appreciate his help. Also on board, we have Mar Margie Evashank. She's the co-founder and vice president of technologies at Sierra Logic in Roseville. She's also the former director of product development at Agilent Technologies. And finally, just recently, we were able to get Glenn Antle. He's a co-founder of one of the big three firms, one of these firms that is involved in a $2 billion a year industry. He's already offered to provide us with contacts for employees and contacts to get some of our initial clients. We're very fortunate to have him on board. Funding we're looking for is in two stages. The initial stage is $150,000 of seed funding to cover our beta testing for the first three months. After that, we're going to need $800,000 to basically get the product off the ground, do some further development on the front end and the back end of the graphical user interface, um, and to get our sales effort ramped up. We hope to be cash flow positive. We will be cash flow positive in quarter seven with a fairly conservative estimate of just seven customers. 
our harvest, the way that we're our exit strategy, is that we plan to be bought out by one of these three firms. And we believe this will happen because they have a history of doing this. The three firms, Cadence, Synopsis, and Mentor Graphics, have spent $2.3 billion from 2002 to 2004 in acquiring firms that can eliminate some of the inefficiencies in the design process. We're going to position ourselves to be, to be taken over by one of those firms. If we cannot get a good offer from one of those three firms, we'll just wait to do an IPO in year four or year five. Why us? We think we have three reasons on why you should invest in us. The first is we're well established in the community through Mr. Schraith, Ms. Evanshek, and Mr. Antle. They're able to, to introduce us to the people who are going to help get our company off the ground. Second, we provide high value for our customers, yet we still maintain high margins for ourselves. That's going to lead to high profitability for our company in the future. And third, our product is designed to work with existing tools in the marketplace, thereby eliminating some of the barriers to entry. It should be a near plug and play solution for a lot of these design firms. Let me give you a quote from Gartner Consulting from late last year. They said, EDA revenue growth, EDA is electronic design automation. It's a circuit design automation that we're talking about. Revenue growth will remain stagnant until new leaders emerge and new technologies could displace current companies dominating this sector. MVP, our flagship product, is that new technology. IDA Technologies is that new company. We're going to begin beta testing later this year. We hope you join us and come on board. With that, I'd like to thank you. And I'd also like to particularly thank Promote and Grant for organizing this and all the students who did their stuff and the sponsors. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Smart Moms. Hello, my name is Elena Nadari. Smart Moms Circle is an online business that will harness one of America's most untapped and ignored resources. 11 million highly skilled and educated stay-at-home moms. The website is also an online community catering to our customers, smart moms, with additional features such as social networking, e-classes, and regional conferences. Stemming from six revenue streams, the market potential is assessed as having a five-year, $138 million revenue opportunity. You may ask us, why us and why now? Of the 45 million women who have earned a college degree, almost 60% will decide to have children and will face workforce re-entry issues when they return to the marketplace. When a mother takes a seven-year gap in employment, she loses about 10 years of her earnings. The impact is discernible even 20 years after re-entry. 9.8 million women already work at home. That's 15.4% of already employed women. Now let's talk about some changes I'm sure we've all been seeing in the workforce trends. Constantly advancing technology and communications has increased the pace in which work is done. Employers like to hire employees who pay for their own training, office, space, and would like to pay them upon the completion of a project. On the other hand, employees like to work at home, choose their own hours, not worry about commute, um, office politics, and daycare for kids. To reinforce this statement even further, a former Xerox executive and MIT professor, Thomas Malone, in his book, The Future of Work, he compares this change of trends to the Industrial Revolution, specifically saying it is changing the business world to the magnitude that the Industrial Revolution did in its time. The development of Smart Mom Circle can be seen as the game of cat, mouse, and cheese. Our employers, the CATs, are attracted to skilled, educated, and ready-to-work stay-at-home moms, our smart moms. The mice, these smart moms are attracted to the support and network and community of smart mom circle, the cheese. This is where the smart mom solution comes in. We will provide a personal profile creation by resume posting and resume updating. Social networking such as chats, meetups, online education allowing the continu ed continuation of education. Employers save money. They post their jobs for free and can choose their qualified candidate at no cost. For employers, we are offering a loyalty dollar program, payment protection, 
free 1099 tax service. And for both our employers and our smart moms, we are offering an online works workspace and um, mediation arbitration to ensure the quality of those um, parties. The market is ready, and we are targeting the 11 million stay-at-home moms, a market value estimated at $675 million. There are several competitors in the, smart mom, in the smart mom circle marketplace, yet no one has a dominant position. Our closest competitor, Guru.com, is broadly focused and has chosen not to address the social networking aspect of our community, which we believe is vital in gaining a leadership position. Our competitive advantage is that we will be the first to integrate all these features on one convenient website. We will compete on the quality of jobs that we post on our website. But the most important thing is the cost of changing to another service is expensive. A mother comes to our website with the benefits that we provide them. Losing our website would be a loss of investment in which they would lose their community, their network, and their profile. With that said, I will leave you with the fabulous Alex Vanderbilt, and he will talk to you about our marketing strategy and our financials. Thank you, Elena. The marketing strategy of Smart Mom Circle will pan out in a four-phase plan. In phase one, we will focus on targeting and building key relationships with alumni and women's organizations. We will also focus on attracting regional employers. We will also include activity, website activity development so we can find out the needs of our users. During phase two, we will focus on fostering viral word of mouth marketing among both employers as well as moms. We will increase online accessibility through the use of AdWords as well as strategic website links. During phase three, we will focus with guerrilla marketing, targeting specifically the PTA as well as human resource organizations. At our final phase, phase four, we plan to make Smart Mom Circle a household name, both accessible through TV, magazines, as well as other easily accessible advertisements. At all times, posting jobs and finding qualified Smart Moms is free for our employers. During the, for our Smart Moms, during the initial six months, we are offering all membership as also a free gratuity. Afterwards, we are offering uh, our membership in three different categories, basic, silver, and gold, with the respective benefits. Along these same lines, I am brought to our revenue sources. Smart Mom Circle has six different revenue sources. Initially, membership subscriptions, as I just mentioned. We have project-based commissions where either 6.5% or 11% of the total project value is withheld, niche market advertising, online education, Smart Moms licensing, where we will roll out with product endorsements such as TV, or excuse me, such as books, toys, and, and additional services. And we also include regional conferences. To, based on highly conservative values, we foresee a five-year revenue potential of 138 million. This ex exponential revenue growth is similar to that seen by Monster.com when they launched in 1996. Our, the number of jobs, as well as the number of memberships, is comparable to that of Guru.com when they launched in 1994. We have a strong, dedicated, and wide variety um, management team that will lead us with the Smart Mom Circle development. We have employees from Intel, Genentech, PG&E, as well as Pfizer. We have a home business owner, as well as a mom of over 20 years. We also have a strong powerhouse advisory board, which includes people such as Jillian Perillo, president of Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy, as well as on the board of the sacramentoexecutives.com. Also, Mark Zetter, who was the co-advisor of the original founders of the Big Bang competition. We also have Heather Stables, a former CMO of ask.com. All members on this, on the, Smart Mom Circle team have graduated from the 2000, as 2006 graduates of the Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy, where we have met and have been working together for the past nine months. Let me show you the money. We are initially asking for 0.5 million in initial startup funding, 
in order to implement our website as well as um, essential marketing. After about nine months, we will seek further investments to hire a CEO, continue implementation of our website features, as well as uh, pursue a more aggressive market strategy. Our exit strategy is as follow. We will build a profitable, stable, and extensible company with the possibility of an IPO. Although other options are being considered as well, including acquisition. Some interesting acquisitions that have happened in our marketplace recently have been those of MySpace, iVillage, as well as About.com, all which have shown high multiples in return. Invest in a strong team. Invest in women and their futures. Invest in Smart Mom Circle. Thank you. No welcome. Hello. It's really exciting to be here tonight. I just want to say thank you all for, for coming and watching us. It's a really exciting opportunity. I want to present to you tonight Novacam Technology. Now, in order for me to explain what Novacam does, I need to give you a little bit of a background on microelectronic packaging. The world we live in is rich with microelectronic devices, microchips. They're in everything that affects our daily lives. Your phones, your iPod, your microwave, you heat up your coffee in the morning, your car. They're in critical applications. They're in hospital medical equipment. They're in air, airport control systems. The world would be a very, very, very different place without the microchip. At the heart of every microchip, as you can see in this little diagram here in blue, is a silicon die. And on the surface of this bit of silicon are millions of transistors interconnected in a way that gives them a certain amount of functionality, which gives your product, which helps your product do the things that your product does. But this bit of silicon is an extremely sensitive thing. And uh, a little bit of dust or some moisture could make it cease functioning completely or um, give it long term reliability problems. So it needs to be protected. And it's usually protected with a, a big dollop of plastic, a mold compound, a polymer. So in addition, the die is usually set on top of a substrate, and the substrate helps route the signals from the surface of the die to the solder balls underneath the package, which help the package attach to the printed circuit board that is eventually put on. And in this substrate, there's also a heavy use of polymer materials, insulating layers, because the substrate usually consists of maybe two, maybe up to 12 different layers of wiring, essentially, that crosses over without short circuiting to get the right signals to the right place on the bottom of the package. So this whole kit and caboodle, the mole compound, the dye, the substrate, the solder balls, this is microelectronics packaging. And it composes of several different polymers, the mole compound and polymers used within the substrate. And it is polymers that Novacam technology makes. Now, nothing new so far. M polymers have been around for a while. Microchips have been around for a while. What is it that Novacam technology really offers? Well, the exciting news is that the microchip, the microelectronics industry is far from having reached his peak. You've probably all heard of Moore's Law. And Moore's Law states that basically the number of transistors uh, per unit area on the surface of the die is going to continue to double every couple of years or so. This is still true. And if you look at the top right, you'll see kind of an S-curve. And what happens below the line is this doubling of growth. And uh, this is basically equivalent to Moore's Law in the electronics industry. Now, in any technological revolution, usually the critical indicator follows an S-curve like this. During the days of the Industrial Revolution, steel consumption was the critical indicator. And uh, it eventually reached an inflection point after its growth period and, and leveled off. The good news is we haven't got there yet in the microelectronics industry. We're still in the growth stage. However, However, there is a problem. There's a barrier. In order for us to continue to get the most out of this technology, the packaging that the silicon chip sits in has to continue to evolve at the same rate as the silicon does. So the silicon's happily evolving away, but we've kind of reached a, uh, a bunch of barriers with the packaging because the more integration we get on the surface of the die, the, the more is happening per unit area, the hotter these chips are operating. And uh, this poses all sorts of mater material issues. In addition, with more inputs and outputs, with more 
more functionality, the packages need to get bigger and bigger. And this also poses a lot of uh, um, restrictions on the sort of materials that can be used. So the packaging is lagging a little bit behind where the silicon's at. And we want to help the industry overcome this problem. Now, these problems are reflected in some industry trends. Up on the left here, you can see that um, over 50% of research and development costs in the advanced microelectronics industry is spent on back-end packaging. 50%. For a company like Intel, that could be a billion dollars. For the industry on a, as, as a whole, we estimate conservatively there's over $10 billion there in, in back-end research and development for the packaging in order to help the packaging keep up with the silicon's progress. Advanced packaging materials are needed to help overcome these problems. Now, essentially, there's two different polymer families that are uh, um, pretty much extensively in use in microelectronics packaging manufacture. You have polyimides, which have a $1 billion just raw material market today, and you have epoxy-based resins with a $1.2 billion material market. So polyimides are really good for the high temperatures that come with the um, progress of the silicon, the next generation of silicon. However, they're expensive. And this is an industry that needs to reduce its cost, it's not, not to increase its cost. Also, it has a high dielectric constant, which basically means that if you have a high frequency signal in one pin, that it's going to cause interference in another pin, and you're going to get signals you don't want, and it's going to cause all sorts of reliability problems. You have poor adhesion to substrates, high moisture absorption, poor dimensional stability, and poor coefficients of thermal expansion, which all cause reliability problems. Basically, five years down the road, ten years down the road, your parts might fail. So polyimides, uh, which were great for small packages, are not so great for large packages and hot packages. Well, they're okay for hot packages. Epoxy-based resins are cheaper. However, they have all the same problems above and more. And some people have even said that there's no place in the future microelectronics packaging for epoxy-based resins. So, in addition to these two existing polymer classes that are used for microelectronics packaging, we need an additional class, one free of the problems. And this is going to help the industry, it's going to help the packaging keep up with the, uh, the development of the silicon. And that is what we're here today to talk about. Our solution, a new family of polymer materials for um, microelectronics packaging, novel liquid crystalline copolyesters. Novochem owns this technology. Th this, this patent has been recently granted, um, and we're, it, it's a family of materials, as I said, so we have a whole slew of uh, IP in the, uh, in the pipeline related to it. Um, it meets all the desired specifications for advanced microelectronics packaging, and, and more. And uh, some of the novel features of it, it has excellent recyclability, something the other polymers don't have. It's green material. It can be ground up, and it can be reused. It's, uh, it's better for the environment. It has low moisture absorption, we talked about earlier, high thermal stability, and good coefficient of expansion, low processing temperatures, good adhesion, and very low dielectric constant. In addition, it's photoimageable. And that means when you're creating a substrate to route the signals from your die to the balls underneath the, uh, the solder balls underneath the package, that um, you can, with, with half the number of processing steps you need for a regular polymer, you can, you can um, um, selectively form insulating layers um, by photoimaging um, layers of the polymer in, into the substrates. It also has a tunable dielectric constant, something not seen before. With a microforming process, you can actually pick your dielectric constant for specific applications. So, the material has been recognized in a number of leading journals. After it was patented, it's been, it's been thoroughly published and uh, highly espoused. And uh, we don't just have uh, neat technology and a solution to a problem. We have a business model. We, we have a, a potential business here. There's two different ways we can sell the product. Either we can manufacture it and go to one of our customers, here you go, here's some plastic for you to make your microchips. We don't make microchips. We just make the polymers. Um, or we can license it to another group of customers who, uh, who wants to then make the product and sell it to their customers. And we are going to adopt a little bit of both here. We've been working with several strategic foundry partners on the manufacturing side who are very willing to help us set up the pilot lines and, and, and make this material, and we've also got a great deal of interest in the IP. And the IP side offers an additional advantage in that um, our exit strategy at the end of the day is by acquisition by a leading electronic materials manufacturer, and by working licensing to some customers, we're developing relationships with potential future um, purchasers. So. We have um, the financials, basically, with a $3 million investment over the first two years, we'll be able to get the business off the ground and be making uh, positive net incomes by the fifth year of about $10 million. And uh, it, we're operating in an extremely favorable market. The Fredonia Research Group's 2005 report basically showed the market's growing at 15%. Great environment to be operating in. 
Um, how can we sustain this advantage? Well, we have the IP. The proof is in the pudding. The material basically excels above the others. Cost. Polyimides cost $4 a pound. Epoxy is $1.60 a pound. Our material costs $2 a pound. It's a low-cost material. It's very competitive with epoxies. It has the best dielectric constants, moisture absorption, thermal stability, and adhesion characteristics, and a very reasonable curing temperature for manufacturing um, prospects. So, do we have what it takes to pull it off? Well, we certainly believe we do. We, we appreciate the importance of a good manager team, and we will be working with the, um, any VCs who are interested to make sure the right management are on board. But our existing team so far, um, our VP of Technology and Acting CEO, Frank, Dr. Frank Shi, um, he is listed on the patent. He, um, he is an original inventor, and uh, he's, he's a PhD in electronic materials, a master's in management from Stanford, and over five years of ex experience in the industry. Myself, um, I'm another material scientist, I'm an MBA JD candidate here at UC Davis, and uh, I've got a good deal of um, industry experience too. Our Chief Technology Officer Beth and our Chief Patent Attorney Brian are also extremely recognized in their fields. <clears throat> so how do we take this from the lab to the fab? How do we get it out of the laboratory and make this a manufacturing reality? Well, our first step is to launch a commercial prototype material within the next nine months. Critical here is that we need to optimize the processes for the factory. Currently in the lab, we're running at 50% yields. We need to be up to about 80, 90% yields in the factory, and this is what about established, this is what a, a pilot line is all about. Um, we need to improve these production yields and, and make this a, a viable production opportunity. This is one of our biggest risks, by the way. We haven't yet got the yields up. We haven't yet had that experience. Um, we need to develop two related, we're going to develop two related materials all under the same umbrella. Um, that IP is already underway. We're formally engaging with manufacturing partners and we're currently seeking our first round of fundraising, $3 million, needed for, to continue the R&D and to purchase necessary equipment. So in conclusion, we have a, a wonderful large and growing market opportunity. We have a real need there. Uh, we have leading technology, strong IP, so we have the competitive advantage, and uh, we have strong management and partners. I didn't get a chance to talk about our partners, but um, you have some excellent partners. We're seeking fundraising of $3 million. So we are Novachem. We're providing a microelectronics packaging industry with a low-cost, high-performance polymer platform. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'd love to take them. Ms. Wrights. Hi, we're Mesolytics. I'm Dan Mesel. I'm Zane Starkey-Wolf. And I'm Farley Stewart. And cars out there. So, <laughs> so Mesolytics is developing a portable handheld sensing platform that will allow <coughs> healthcare professionals to quickly, easily, and accurately detect common and critical medical illnesses right at the point of care, at the doctor's office or in the emergency room. It's based on silicon nanowire technology that's been proven to be able to detect molecular bindings down to the level of a single individual virus. With this, we'll be able to produce basically laboratory level sensitivity, instantaneous results all in the palm of your hand. What we'll generate revenues from is the sale of single-use disposable test cartridges with the initial cartridge being focused on influenza, including the ability to detect certain subtypes such as H5N1, uh, which is responsible for the current avian flu infant in, uh, in epidemic. We believe that the concern over the possible global pandemic will actually help drive adoption of our platform in the uh, offices of physicians and emergency rooms. And then once that platform is established, we'll introduce additional test cartridges for broader respiratory infections, sexually transmitted diseases, and biosecurity threats. So respiratory infections are actually the number one cause of sickness and death worldwide. And it's actually the number one reason people go to see the doctor in the first place. However, the inability to be able to quickly distinguish between bacterial oriented infections and viral infections often leads to improper diagnosis and treatment, such as giving antibiotics when they really aren't effective. With respect to influenza, which is a common cause of respiratory infections, it kills 36,000 people and an alarming over half a million worldwide. Antiviral treatments are available, such as Tamiflu. However, to be effective, they must be administered in the first 48 hours. So it's absolutely critical for a doctor to be able to 
diagnosed in the office and distinguished between influenza and other rep respiratory infections. With respect to H5N1, this is actually spreading throughout the globe in birds right now and is expected to be in Davis within the next couple of years. Of the human cases of infection, 50% have died and they've died in a very, very rapid time frame. And because the possibility exists for mutations to cause human-to-human -human transmission, it's going to be absolutely critical to be able to, while the patient is there at the emergency room or the doctor, to understand what they have and the specific subtypes of flu, such do they have H5N1, and if so, to be able to isolate them and give them proper care and treatment. So the initial target is the U.S. point of care uh, rapid test market. Um, about 900 million visits take place to healthcare each year, and roughly about 10% are for respiratory related illnesses. So, in the process of diagnosing them, 15 million rapid bacterial strep tests are performed. So, rapid influenza testing is poised to achieve similar levels and represents a $150 million market opportunity. In addition, follow on products. Um, combined represent market opportunities in excess of one billion. And the technology is extremely versatile and can be adapted to a number of technologies, including uh, the international point of care market where the product can save a tremendous number of lives. I want to turn it over to Dan to talk about our team and technology. <coughs> yeah, so our team is one of our biggest advantages here at Mesolytics. We have a, an extremely diverse and uh, complementary skill set that should get us through our proof of concept. Um, Personally, uh, me and Zane have extensive experience in chemistry and nanotechnology. Uh, Kara is just excellent at everything bio, basically, you can imagine. And Farley has over 19 years of uh, management experience and a degree in electronics engineering as well. In the future, we anticipate needing some other folks for uh, marketing and business development, but um, up to the proof of concept, this should do us good. Um, our board of advisors has been extremely helpful to us uh, up until now. Uh, we wouldn't have got here without them, essentially. Uh, Peter Matlock uh, has extensive experience in the uh, SAC community with biotech startups. Uh, Dr. Judith Chelstrom in the audience here uh, is the uh, director of the UC Davis Biotechnology Program. Dr. Tinguo uh, is an internationally renowned scholar in uh, nanomaterials. And my father, Doug Masel, has over 23 years of uh, experience in healthcare technology and marketing. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about our technology here. So the basis of our technology is uh, silicon nanowires. You can think of these as just a normal wire that's roughly 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of your human hair. Um, what we do with these wires is we lay them out on a plastic substrate that we then pattern with gold. Um, we use a novel soft lithography technique developed here at UC Davis to then um, cut out channels in this gold, essentially, um, that we then fill with fluid to functionalize the nanowires. Functionalization is simply, essentially just a process of attaching something to the nanowire. And in this case, what we're attaching is antibodies that can then later bind the virus that we're hoping to identify. Um, so after we finish this process, we package it into our cartridge, send it off to your doctor, and when you go in to get a test, he'll swipe the back of your mouth with a, uh, with a swab and uh, wipe that swab over the test surface of our cartridge. If there's a virus in your system, um, it'll then bind to the antibodies in a particular lane of our car cartridge, and uh, our test will then in this unfortunate case, apparently come out positive. <laughs> um, uh, some of the key benefits of the platform here are that um, we can simultaneously test for hundreds of different analytes on a single test cartridge. Um, each lane of gold, or each uh, lane with nanowires in it, can detect a different analyte. So um, we could detect multiple diseases on a single cartridge. We're just starting with influenza because it's a sensible way to begin. Um, it's also extensible to a, a wide array of targets outside of the medical industry. We can do uh, a wide array of chemicals of interest to, um, to industry. And uh, our way of measuring, uh, our conductivity measurements are instantaneous uh, and allow us to do it in a portable device. Um, the nanowires uh, can detect things at extremely low concentration and um, the binding of our chemistry should make uh, our device more tolerant to mutation than uh, comparable flu tests. So I'm going to pass it on to Zane here to talk a little bit about our manufacturing. All right, well, so we envision that the cartridges will be manufactured, hopefully, in uh, West Sacramento. That will provide several benefits as uh, affordable manufacturing space, as well as skilled labor pool in Sacramento, and fantastic researchers from UC Davis. Um, so the, again, the nanowire synthesis process is novel. Coming out of UC Davis, it uses bulk materials and uh, provides us the, the materials that we need for this test cartridge. We can then use the soft lithography. Soft lithography is basically the ability to manufacture things as opposed to hard lithography, which is 
sort of like your computer chip design. You know, you have to use a lot of equipment. It's very expensive capital overhead. Whereas self-authority, you can do it on a, on a bench top. It's wet chemistry. So very easy to manufacture and keeps the cost down. And then the functionalization of this process will be done by us as well. Again, the antibodies for this process, you can purchase from several companies, including antibodies that are located here in Davis. And then the cartridges that we use with our handheld device, and then that manufacturing of that device can be outsourced to companies that deal with specific design and manufacturing medical devices. So I'd like you to picture for a second the following scenario. Uh, say you go to an event, um, perhaps an event such as this, like a uh, Big Bang Finals event, and a few hours later you get an email from, say, Virginia Hinshaw saying that one of the audience members or one of the panelists uh, has avian influenza, right? <laughs> Scary thought. So, of course, you rush to the doctor, you want to get tested, you rush to Cowell Student Health Center, and uh, you don't want to infect your family, your friends, your drinking buddies, right? So. Uh, they're going to run, there are several options that they can test for this. Um, the lab-based methods, they send it off to a lab and it takes between 1 to 10 days to get results. Unfortunately, that's not enough time uh, to apply antivirals. That's, uh, you, you really need to get the antiviral within 48 hours for it to be effective. And also, you're going to be in quarantine for all that time. So, there is a rapid test uh, available for this technology as well. Unfortunately, 30% of the time, you're going to walk out of the office having the virus and it's going to say you don't. So you're going to go home and then infect your family, your loved ones, your children. So that's unacceptable. And so with the Managed Assistance platform, we offer instantaneous results in your doctor's office with a simple press of a button to check if you have it and with incredibly accurate results. Uh, Far is going to tell you about Luba's sales and marketing. Um, so we plan to deploy a razor and blades type of business model to sell this product, basically getting the, the meter itself out very inexpensively to, to drive adoption and then generating the bulk of our revenues and profits from the sale of the disposable test cartridges. Um, we uh, can manufacture them roughly about $2.50 and we brings us very, very healthy margins. Plan to use medical med major uh, companies, med yeah, major medical supply companies that already have existing relationships with the customers. And from a promotional perspective, a variety of means, but one of the key things would be partnering with antiviral companies such as Roche, who's the manufacturer of Tamiflu, because these are the companies that really stand to gain a lot from early, rapid, and accurate uh, detection of influenza. In terms of where we're at, uh, essentially we're currently developing a proof of concept here. Um, we hope to use the Big Bang winnings to complete that process. And afterwards we'll be seeking a, a Series A round of $4 million, uh, and from that we'll be able to put together the prototype, get our patents in place and conduct the clinical trials. Um, subsequent to that, we'll be looking at $9 million in a Series B round to basically uh, get the product into production, complete the FDA approval process, and launch it into the marketplace. We expect first revenues in Q3 of 2008 and slight profitability towards the end of 2009. So in summary, Mesolytics is developing a portable handheld sensing platform that allows healthcare professionals to quickly, easily, accurately diagnose critical medical ailments at the point of care. It can use low sample volumes of drop of blood, swab from your throat, and it can simultaneously test for multiple pathogens. We believe these gives us significant competitive advantages over existing rapid test kits as well as laboratory-based diagnostics, diagnostic, yeah, diagnostics, and allow us to capture basically a, a substantial chunk of the large and rapidly growing point of care uh, test market. Um, our revenues will be from single-use disposable test cartridges. We'll be looking for four million in funding when we're done with the proof of concept and expect to achieve profitability in late 2009. So I want to thank you for your time and certainly appreciate your vote. Ensembles. First, we would like to thank the Big Bang Business Plan Committee for giving us the opportunity to present our business plan today. We are thrilled to be here and this has been a fantastic opportunity for us. My name is Juliette Hodder. Our business is called Ensembles. It's a meal assembly kitchen of which our first outlet will be officially open for business on the 31st of this month. I am a current student at the UC Davis Graduate School of Man Management's new Bay Area Working Adults program, 
I recently left a career consulting and recruiting firm, which I started, and before that I was working in operations at Charles Schwab. I am also a working mother of two kids and I live in the Bay Area. My responsibilities at Ensembles include store operations, personnel management, and business strategy. Hi, my name is Leslie Leach. I'm a former brand manager with the Clorox company, um, where I developed and launched several new products and product improvements for them. Um, I also led the marketing plan and the volume and profit forecasting for the largest brand in the company. I received my MBA from the UCLA Anderson School, where I focused in marketing. And my responsibilities with ensembles include general management, marketing, and financial management. Um, the other name that you see up here couldn't be here tonight. Anne Marie Ramo is our executive chef. Instead of her coming, she sent cookies for you, which are coming around um, because she wanted to be here in some way. But she is back in San Ramon cooking because, as Juliet said, we are opening in about 10 days. <laughs> Um, she's responsible for um, menu and recipe development, food procurement and cooking with ensembles. She's the former executive chef for Adele Sausage Company, where she um, launched more than 15 nationally distributed consumer products. Prior to that, she was the curriculum manager for home chef cooking schools, where her role was to both develop recipes and teach um, specifically for home cooks which is really critical to our business, as you'll see. In addition to the owners, we've also assembled a, a core group of advisors in all of the essential disciplines. All right. What's for dinner? This is the never-ending question faced by busy moms. Um, people are aware of the health and psychological benefits of families sitting around the table for a home-cooked meal together. Um, in fact, the percent of meals prepared and eaten in the home has increased in recent years and is up to about 80%. At the same time, restaurant spending, which had been increasing since the 1940s, has been flat over the past five years. So people are feeling that desire to eat at home together and, know, and they know the benefits of this. But at the same time, it's become increasingly difficult to achieve this and to create this meal. 71% um, of mothers with children under 18 are in the workforce. Um, children's time spent in organized activities has increased. Um, in fact, the amount of time that Americans today spend preparing dinner has decreased from two and a half hours in the 1960s to 30 minutes today. And that's a lot, I think. <laughs> um, the demographics of the Bay Area only exacerbate these trends. How high housing costs force both parents to work. Um, an emphasis on athletics causes families to spend late afternoons and evenings at um, sporting events and practices. Long commute times cause parents to return home close to dinner and leaving li it leaves little time for preparing that meal. I just want to tell you a little bit more about our bullseye target consumer. We call her the guardian mom. Um, she's concerned about her family's nutrition and health. It's important to her that the family sit down for a home-cooked meal uh, regularly. But her schedule is packed with work and her children's activities. And several nights each week, she has to resort to take out and frozen dinner. Um, I know this target intimately, not only because we are guardian moms, but also because this is the target that I've been developing products for at the Clorox company over the past several years, and I've been able to leverage um, that knowledge for ensembles. Um, so there's a tremendous need here, and this is what Ensembles is designed to solve. So what is Ensembles? We are a meal assembly kitchen. Here's how it works. Customers come to our website, they reserve a time to come into our store, and they choose the menu items that they want to make. When they come into the store, they rotate uh, from station to station, and we help them assemble four, up to 14 family-sized meals. They take them home and freeze them, and on nights when they don't have time to cook from scratch, they have a home-cooked meal ready in as little as 10 minutes. So we'd like to give you a preview of our website. Um, so first thing, when customers want to, want to use ensembles, they go to our calendar and they choose a session time that works for them. There are, night, there are evening hours, weekend hours, and daytime hours. Um, next, when they've selected their time and reserved their space, they go to the menu and they can select, uh, they have to select a minimum of eight meals that they want to make. And they're able to see descriptions of the meals, nutritional information, and cooking times to help them make their selections. 
when they come into the store, there are 14 stations set up. Each one has a recipe with the instructions on how to make the meal, and all of the ingredients are all in front of them, washed, chopped, with the proper measuring tool in a refrigerated food prep table. So they're able to make their meal in about eight minutes, and they, um, they are helped by the staff who offer cooking tips and help them customize the meals to their family's preferences. Um, the meals are packaged in disposable packaging like this, and they stick on a cooking instructions label, which um, they can follow at home, and they're very simple and straightforward. As I said, our, our chef is an expert in developing um, this kind of instruction. Um, the, the key benefits of the ensemble service are the ability to prepare this delicious, healthy, and interesting meals that you couldn't normally make on your own very quickly and at a more convenient time than the dinner time rush. At the same time, we offer a better value than takeout or restaurant meals. Um, each ensemble's meal costs between $18 and $24 and serves four to six people. This works out to three to four dollars a serving compared to fast food, which is about six dollars a serving, um, takeout about eight dollars, and a family restaurant, 10 to 12 dollars per serving. Now that I've explained the unmet need and how ensembles fulfill the need, um, my partner Juliet is going to take you through the scope of the opportunity and some high level on our business model. Thank you. The meal assembly industry, as it has become known as over the past few years, is growing rapidly in other parts of the country. <clears throat> there are over 700 outlets now, nationwide, with 40 new outlets each month. 40 new outlets opening each month. However, in California, and in particularly the Bay Area, this market is severely underdeveloped. For example, in the greater Seattle area, there are 42 outlets serving 3.5 million people, compared to 10 outlets in the Bay Area serving 6.8 million people. We can see how booked up these sessions are by looking at our competitors' websites, and most sessions do appear to sell out or come close to selling out within two weeks of each session. This chart shows the penetration of meal assembly outlets per gross state product, and you can see how significantly California is behind the other large states. This leads us to the question of how will we differentiate ourselves? How will make, we make ourselves unique? The um, analysis in this section was based on meal assembly com customer focus groups that we ran, numerous interviews we've had with competitors, and um, numerous interviews we've had with the, our local clientele. And what we've learned at that is that these three factors were the most important to our target customer. So this is how we are going to differentiate ourselves. First off, our food is going to be superior. It will have a world view. Second, our customer experience will be superior and we will take something that every, that's being offered now and make it better. Our customers will come into our store, they'll learn something new, they'll get free advice, free cooking techniques, and more. And finally, the consistency of our meal success. At Ensembles, our meals go through three rounds of testing, with the final round going to real consumers that we have selected as our test families. This really sets us apart from the local competition, whose meals are either just not coming out or don't meet the taste of their local palate. This leads us to our marketing plan. How are we going to establish our brand? What are we going to do to get customers into our store? And how are we going to get them to come back? Our strategy is to establish ensembles as the preferred meal assembly business due to quality and variety of food and the unique in-store experience. Our objectives are based on actual benchmarking that we've been able to do around the country. I don't have time to go over our entire marketing mix, but I do want to highlight our promotional tactics. We've learned from focus groups that the biggest factor, the biggest barrier for customers was concern over food quality. Are you willing to spend such a large ticket without the assurance that the food will taste good? As a result, our promotional tactics will include preview nights where customers will get a chance to come in and sample our foods and take home some of our collateral. We will also be attending community events and doing a lot of grassroots marketing, also allowing our customers to sample our food. Ensembles is not just a business plan. We have already done significant work toward opening up our first store. Our financials and capital requirements are based on our actual experience. And based on this experience, we predict it takes about eight months to get a new store to market. 
We are passionate about this business. We want this business to grow into a healthy company, and we have the team to do it. Thank you for your attention. Good evening, my name is Laura Pallas, and the rest of my team, Brad Olson, Mark Gannon, and Marco Garcia are going to pass around an example of our product, and they just happen to be chocolate chip cookies. We didn't plan it. We did not plan it with ensembles, I promise. So I'm here to talk about Soyum, a natural replacement for eggs and milk and food products. This baked good is just one example. So we know that Soyum can make a huge impact in the food industry, which is why we are here, because we want you to know that the next time you go to the grocery store, we want you to see Soyum out there. So despite recent pharmaceutical advancements that allow many to lower their cholesterol levels, heart disease is still the leading cause of death in America. In fact, one out of two people in this room right now are at risk of developing heart disease. That's a scary number. So you look at your partner next to you and you say, okay, I'm not it. <laughs> so even with the new statin drugs, many Americans still need to change their diets, but they're finding this challenging. For example, 88% of Americans bake dessert at least one time a week. 97% of Americans will eat dessert three or more times. So you've already got one down this week. Clearly a product that allows people to continue eating the same foods in the same way while addressing this critical health need has a place in the market. So just as Splenda allows people to drink Coke and make healthier products while enjoying those health, healthier, better characteristics, Soyum will allow them to eat the dessert that they want without the negative health repercussions. So another topic I'd like to, to highlight is dietary difficulties. Many Americans suffer from food allergies and food intolerances. A food allergy initiates an immune system response that could result in death. A food intolerance is an, an adverse reaction that occurs in your body that gives you a, a major discomfort. Lactose intolerance is an example of this. Because Soyum replaces milk and eggs in food products, it enables families of millions of Americans to enjoy these new products that they wouldn't otherwise be able to have. And especially the big target here is those that may be allergic or intolerant to milk and eggs or just don't want to eat milk and eggs. While many ingredients and food can claim to be healthy, they also will often lose their taste. So we hope you liked your cookies. Dietitians will tell you that people trying to get them to change their diet is a difficult challenge because soyum replaces the cholesterol sources like eggs and milk without altering the taste or texture of the finished food. It will enable many to eat healthier food without the painful changes to their diets. This can be seen in your cookies. This chart that is up here right now is the result of a blind test that we did with 15 participants. They rated a cake made with soyum, and they also rated a cake that consisted of milk and eggs. There was a nine point scale with nine being the highest. The results in the chart demonstrate that our product made with soyum can be as good as those that are made with milk and eggs. This is an abbreviated version of a nutritional facts that you would potentially see on a box of soyum like Splenda by itself in the store. So on the left you have the soyum nutritional facts. On the right you have nutritional facts for eggs and milk. And this scenario is replacing soyum in a cake mix that you would buy on the store that requires you to put milk and eggs in it. So typical cake mixes require three quarters cup milk and two eggs. That's where that number came from. Soyum is a new twist on traditional Chinese soy preparation. It enables soybeans 
to be processed into a powdered form for use in baked goods without altering our taste or consistency of the final food. Soy protein is one of the only proteins that is complete from plant sources. While animal products do contain complete proteins, they also contain cholesterol. Since high cholesterol is strongly linked to heart disease, including soy in products will help reduce the amount of cholesterol or eliminate that in the resulting product. Soy also has lower calories, as you can see, approximately about 125 calories less than the alternative milk and eggs. As an ingredient in other products, soyum is not a solution to the critical health problems, but rather it's a component that enables production of food with healthier characteristics. When combined with other healthy ingredients, soyum contributes to a healthier final product. So initially, we are targeting the baked goods market. We feel that soyum could be all over the market. But this is where we're going to begin with. With $46 billion in retail sales in 2005, occurring to Euro Monitor, the baked goods market represents a substantial opportunity for soyum. By helping those packaged food manufacturers, companies like Kraft, Kellogg, and General Mills make healthier products, soyum is our answer. Based on a normal ratio of two hundredths of a pound of soyum to a dollar of baked good, if every baked good in the chart used soyum, more than 900 million pounds of soyum would be required to process. Since only a percentage of the market is going to be focused on healthier products, we believe that the total addressable market is 25 percent of this, or 180 million pounds of soyum annually. So with an estimated average selling price of $6 per pound, and this is going to larger companies, Soyum has a total addressable market of $1 billion. While this is a rough estimate because it is in a new market, clearly Soyum has a, a significant market opportunity. So we're currently working with the university's technology transfer office. We have three potential patents that we have disclosed to them. One is the process for making soyum. Two is our actual process, product, which is soyum. And then our application into the food products. So our technology. I can highlight some of what we're doing. We're using raw ingredients that are, are widely available. You've got soybeans and you have all natural ingredients. These all natural ingredients are the secret to what we're making here. So we have this and what we're doing is we're going through our novel process to get a powdered form of soy. This is accomplished by standard equipment in the soy industry. Soyum is robust and stable because it uses widely available ingredients on standard industry equipment. So we're seeking funding for the rest of this year to apply for our patents, secure sole licensing from UC Davis, conduct large-scale sensory testing, and salary our employees. Thus far, we have raised 3000 for our product. Our next step in 2007 will be finding customers who will run test markets and arrange manufacturing facilities. Our goal is to secure two high-volume products by 2007 and 10 high volume products by 2008. In 2008, we predict that we will break even, hopefully even better, and be profitable by 2009. The packaged food market features large and small companies that have different market footprints. So while the large companies do have a high volume product, that have potentially higher volume customers, the difficulty for us is that it can take up to a year or more to actually get our product on the shelf. Whereas if you have small companies, they're going to have a smaller product volume movement, but they're going to get the product out there faster. So what we're doing is to make use of these bigger companies, we're going to start out with those little ones 
and the big ones at the same time. So with, sorry, okay. And the other point I wanted to make on this slide was our goal is to be like Splenda. Where you see Splenda in your Coke cans, our goal is that you can see the Soyum logo on Betty Crocker and cereal boxes, et cetera. So our management team consists of myself as the president, and we have the quality assurance, which is what Marco would be running. We have our sales and marketing, which is where Mark and Brad would come in, and then we have our finance chair, which would be Norm Hicks, who is not president. We have openings for products, process specialists, and then our board of directors would include our investors and people that are ready for, people that want to help us get going and our team members. So some of the backgrounds for us is that we have three solid master students in food science. We have two engineers and, sorry, I'm getting the hand wave, so it's quite distracting. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with that in mind, we feel like we are, yes, we are a young team, but we feel like we have many years to grow into something quite big. Thank you for your time this evening. So, a couple of things before we take a break. Mark just one team. If you mark two of them, your ballot gets void. That's the obvious one. Second, we have a beer and wine bar outside, so please join us for something. We'll meet again in 15 minutes. Before we announce the winners, join me in thanking all the, present all the presenters and <laughs> I think we'll all agree that the six teams that came out did a very good job. And let's see where, what happens next. So, the people have spoken. Your words first. The People's Choice Award goes to Smart Moms. Please come on over. So now here is the fun that happened this evening. The judges deliberated for about an hour, maybe like 55 minutes, to come up with the two winners. It was really, really, really difficult. And I'm not kidding, and you'll know why. They could not decide who the winner was. So we have joint winners for the first and the second place. Both of them are first prize winners. And let's have a drum roll. <laughs> so the finalists of this year's Big Bang competition are Ensembles and Mizoites. <laughs> Please come on up. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming, and with that, we end our stuff.
Thank you.